Hello, everyone. Welcome to the five-part webinar series on community management. I am your moderator, Judy Gordon, VP of Marketing for OmniSparks. Before we get started, a couple of housekeeping tips. You should see a chat function in your view. Please enter any questions there or on the OmniSparks Telegram channel at OmniSparks. We will be answering questions at the end. Today is the third webinar in our series. We are going to talk about engaging community through education. Before we get started, a quick word about our sponsors. OmniSparks is the premier collaboration platform for crypto organizations to create and share value within their communities. For more information, visit OmniSparks.io. The Chicago Blockchain Project is building an infrastructure for the city of Chicago, connecting builders with resources and investors. We are thrilled today to have Jenny from the Chicago Blockchain Project and Lazar from Market Protocol to talk to, about, to us about education and engaging communities through education. And now Jenny and Lazar. Okay, so the first uh, the first slide just talks about um, how teachers are the first blockchain. It's kind of something that I talk to people about because um, sometimes when people don't understand about blockchain, right, there there's a lot of education that goes into that. And so the way I explain that is just that if you've ever tried to make a five-year-old do anything, um, you realize you need to incentivize them. And it, it generally needs to be tokenized in some way, definitely not um, cryptocurrency tokenized, but we all had our own token economies in the classroom. And the way that that encouraged engagement or proper behavior was that, you know, students were given different incentives for following the rules, right? So instead, when someone didn't follow the rules, then in, instead of like calling them out on it, you would just praise everyone else by giving them, and I used Humpty Box because it, Humpty Dumpty was our curriculum and it had to go with the behavior theorist I went with, which is Corwin Cronenberg. So anyway, what that did was that uh, created almost like a blockchain because it was distributed, although it wasn't ever written down because every kid in that class knew on Friday when we had our exchange of value, um, when they could take their Humpty Bucks, right? And they could buy little trinkets. They all knew exactly whose, was, uh, whose money was authentic and whose was not. And so that's just kind of like how one of the first examples I always talk about with blockchain. Um, one of the theories I use a lot was responsive classroom and responsive classroom just really was about making people feel special and empowered. Whether it was like a morning meeting, like a greeting, many of the, uh, the communities that I'm part of, it seems like it's such a welcoming community. and People are always, you know, greeting each other. There's lots of memes going around. Same thing with sorority life, right? Like there's these little things that make things special. So um, Lazar, how do you see that happening in uh, in market protocol and your experience? In my experience, the, probably the best way to start encouraging interaction and higher level of engagement is to definitely make sure that you are empowering people with an opportunity to participate in the creation of your product so that they feel like they were laying down the bricks of its foundation. There were, there's a lot of examples that you know we at Market Protocol have used along the path to encourage people's participation because we uh, were building our protocol and our recently launched uh, DEX uh, in a fully open source environment and therefore incentivize people to join us first and foremost as a part of our developer community. And, you know, we also encouraged people to participate in building the messaging around our products by, uh, you know, organizing polls, different design contests, and et cetera, et cetera right? So uh, I believe that uh, in, in, it's very important to approach people when you're educating them about your project with a high dose of empathy, right? You have to know from which background one is coming from in order to be able to assist their needs to your best extent, right? And keep them interested along the way. Um, and of course, most importantly, in my personal opinion right now, since we are, you know, 
experiencing uh, very uh, hard market conditions, uh, that's where true engaging communities arise because those are the communities where the community managers have been able to provide people the true value, right? Not the value of the token, but they went far beyond that and, you know, uh, teach people about the importance of their projects and importance of their use cases. But, you know, I, I would say that it's also very important to um, to be a part of the team, basically, that knows its what's and why's as well, since that's, you know, that that's very helpful as well in the process. Yeah, and that really goes right into the next slide. I think you really kicked it off well because um, exactly what you're talking about there when you're talking about empathy and um, the different teachable moments, empowerment. I think you hit on absolutely everything there as far as theory goes. Um, and I don't even really need to talk too much more about it. Um, I'm just curious to see how, uh, you know, how do you how do you go about teaching like in the in the community when someone, you know, is a little confused or there's a little bit of misinformation? How do you, um, you know, go about doing that? Because I know how to do it in a classroom, but I'm always curious how to do it in a community. Well, that's that's a very hard thing to do in general, uh, basically because the main issue we I mean, main issue and the benefit of crypto is that people discover it as a good, you know, uh, price in increase mechanism in a way, right? So we all once came for the price, but your task as a community manager uh, is to get people to stay because of all the value and the fundamentals that surround whether, you know, your community, whether that's a community that's based around a project or an ideology or any kind of like local awareness like we have in Chicago right now. For instance. So if your project, you know, um, be more precise uh, when I'm talking about which community I'm referring to, it only uh, sort of empowers engagement based on the value of your token, you must do, you know, the best possible job to keep them interested in your product, as I said. Now, there's a lot of, uh, you know, projects that, um, have a token in place for instance nowadays but they still don't have a product developed which doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing for them because as i said previously they can benefit largely and influence uh, meaningful interaction through educating people on the benefits of that project and the, the the final product itself and its use cases of course so if you teach people your use case fundamentals and you go beyond just teaching them about your sale details, uh, I would believe that you can anticipate that the level of interaction and its quality will eventually come to a point where you can be very satisfied with it as a community manager of that's, you know, guiding a project. Of course, there, as I said, there's there are other types of communities, right? You know, there are a lot of uh, influencer and ideological communities starting right now in crypto in the last 12 months or so. So I've seen those communities, for instance, grow and scale uh, based on the quality of the news that's being distributed there. And, uh, you know, good example would be sharing insightful tech fundamentals, important event information, you know, or whatever the other reason is for that group to exist. Um, we have a great local community example in uh, Shy Town Crypto Chat, right? Who I'm, I can say I'm very proud of has never became a you know TA pump and dump signals group, but it was always a rather philosophical, and ideological, and local community event oriented, uh, you know, and project support community. And you know, most credits go to the teachers, right? So I, I mean, I don't know you as a teacher. I would love if you can give us some sort of theoretical approach to how you see. Uh, people should approach their communities as community managers from a theory perspective. And I can, you know, go back and tell you, you know, how other people taught me to become a better community manager myself as good teachers, like Joe, for example. Absolutely. I'd love to. Well, the first one up there is the professional learning communities at work. And that was one of the philosophies of um, Richard DeBoer. It actually started right outside of Chicago at Stevenson High School. And all that means is that everyone's hands are on deck, right? So in, uh, I'll give you an example in the classroom and then I'll apply it. So um, in the classroom, you have a student that's not making the grade, right? They're struggling, whatever they have, they, whether they have um, socio-emotional issues, like, you know, 
rough home life or they just are not getting it academically. What professional learning communities do is they transcend the boundaries of traditional roles of teaching, where the teacher teaches and the assistant assists and the principal administers and no one ever crosses boundaries. What professional learning communities do is very much uh, just it's very much like kind of like blockchain or like I would say the um, blockchain mentality is right. It doesn't matter what your role is. It's very startup too. It doesn't matter what your role is. You're just going to do it to get the job done. And that's where professional learning communities um, at work come in, right? So that motivation um, is always focused on the end goal. So as Lazar was speaking, right, he was talking about sometimes people have a token and they don't have a product, right? But they're still educating upon what their use or their problem is. And maybe people do not even understand that problem. And maybe the team doesn't fully understand that problem. And I think that's where a lot of different aspects of that professional learning community's idea comes in. And then that next bullet talks about um, G I J I T is like it was it was a long time ago in economics, um, but it was called just in time. And it's more like a just in time approach to knowledge. So like you know, I see oh okay, you know, you're not understanding my use case, but I'm going to give you like these three articles, and maybe you're going to see a little bit more or different view. So that's um, that's one. Those are the two uh, bullet points. And then that last um, bullet point I'll quick touch on. And I think we touch on it later is that jigsaw methodology. Right. Jigsaw means that in the classroom would be that you have a topic and you divide that topic up and the children or the students or whatever grade you're teaching, whether it's adults, um, everyone goes off and does their own research. But then the beauty of that and this is where community comes in is that you come back and you will, those people teach the rest of the class. They are now that expert, right? So that is huge. That when you, and I think Franklin touched on it last week, um, how he said that detractors um, can be easily turned into, well, not exactly easily, but mostly usually easily, um, can be turned into contributors. And all it takes is to figure out where they're coming from, like Lazar was talking about, right? Once you figure out where they're coming from, maybe you shoot them a few articles, you don't even have to say anything, right? Because you're just offering them information and education. And then you harness that because they want to come back and they want to teach. Mainly everyone wants to be inherently good and mainly everyone wants to contribute value in some way, right? Otherwise, why would they be in the telegram or why would they be in a community? So you just have to kind of pick that apart. And that's the theory behind it is just the motivating comes from the empowerment you get when you educate. So when you educate, that leads to, um, oh, okay, now I understand, so now I'm empowered, right? And now I wanna give back, it's that cycle. And that, that cycle is in marketing, it's in politics, it's everywhere, right? But it's that same basic theory. Lazar, what is your experience with that? Definitely the, the same as you gave it in, in theory. And honestly, before we even you know, started this webinar, I, I thought that we're gonna probably mismatch by a little, but it seems like that you know, the practices that were developed in crypto are pretty much so aligned with everything that you just said. And I, I will definitely try to give just people the practical examples. This time, not go too high level, but go really straightforward to the, you know, to, to very concrete examples. Like, um, I, I work on a project right now that, you know, inherently is not something that people know you know, as they grow, you know, trading derivatives is a, is a very complex topic for most individuals. And it was for me in the first place. And the first thing that I can acknowledge that Jenny said correctly is that it, the most important thing that you need to do when you're when you're supposed to you know learn about something is to be aware that, um, you know, the as we already said, that the best way to provide the value itself to is to keep that flow of education going. So for me, uh, started off by learning the techniques to, you know, keep that flow going from people like Joe, for instance, and Hannah, because those are the first people that impacted me in the crypto space through the, you know, uh, meetup uh, communities and through our, you know, locally based chat. So I agree 100% with you that it's, it's out of utmost importance to keep the flow going, but it has to start from somewhere, right? So somebody needs to create that content, put it in the right context, target the right demographics that, that you know, uh, and think about the demographics when creating that content and context to make it, you know, tangible. 
Uh, and, you know, that's something that's definitely due to, uh, you know, going to spark the interest of the community and in the end, create high quality engagement, right? So um, I agree 100%, Jenny, that, you know, the keeping the flow of education is extremely important. And again, as I said, creating meaningful content is what everything starts with. Like for instance, we, as I said, knew exactly that nobody should inherently know much about derivatives trading. So what we did was we, we thought, okay, what are derivatives good for, right? What would people use derivatives for? And then by going down that path, we were able to easily define and relate our use cases with the use cases of derivatives, with the use cases of the blockchain technology. And we found that the most meaningful content that we ever made was actually the content explaining people the fundamentals and the basics of, for instance, blockchains versus protocols and versus decentralized exchanges or, you know, uh, explaining them the basics of derivatives in general. So all of the content that we created uh, as sort of like explaining like a kind of five mantra is the thing that, you know, in the end, gave the highest level of engagement within our community and, and you know, sort of uh, proven that, you know, everything, you know, starts and ends with education when building that community. Yeah. I love that. I love exactly how you said that about context, too. I think that's so important. It goes back to the earlier slide, too, right? You have to, like, Lazar is the one who taught me about mining. Lazar is the one that taught me, gave me my first article. I was like, teach me Bitcoin like I'm five. I did not understand that. I did not come from fintech. I did not come from any financial background, um, except a little bit of merchant processing. So I understood a little bit about it, but not much. And what Lazar did was he took, he figured that out, right? And when I was asking questions, and he figured out a way to teach so that I understood it. And that is huge in every classroom or every community. You have to reach the people that you're teach that you, your audience, but you have to reach them at their level, and that that goes right back to the professional learning communities as well. You're not going to, you know, and I think May even talked about that when Constantor was um, in our first webinar, right? She talked about the different audiences, and the same thing goes with the different educational levels. There's going to be some people that are very well versed and very high technical. And you want to speak with them in a different way. You want to educate them more in a different way, right? But then at the same time, you're going to have these people like me who know nothing. And it's it's empathy, it's patience. I mean, I was so excited to do this webinar with Lazar because he definitely, in my opinion, embodies exactly what um, response to intervention. Oh, uh, that's just another education term. It means help people, right? Um, help kids succeed and same thing with professional learning communities and um the jigsaw and i mean it's all methodology it's all these same basic philosophies in education they all boil down to one thing if you can't educate if the person has not learned then you have not educated and whether it's content whatever it is it needs to be understandable and if it's not that's when you you know go back and you do your needs and oh okay where was the misunderstanding so I think that Lazar is a perfect example of how to do this in a practical community. And then if you wanna to go to the next slide, um, we can quickly talk about just, and I think um, I'm just gonna go over this kind of very briefly because in, you know, we talked about this a lot in, um, in school, but at the same time, and it was more so towards teachers and making committees and things like that. But it's just these processes that teams go through and um, it's there. It's from um, Bruce Tuckman. He's a, uh, and he just said that every team is going to go through these. And I never really saw this until you know we were in our professional learning community for grad school, and it was it was very much sequential like this, where you had the forming of, and everyone was excited, and there was all these pleasantries, and then you have the storming where all the, you know, your your diverse um, strengths come out, and then the norming value for us was always like, what does it look like? What does it feel like? What um, What's your, the disposition of it? And how can we move that to a goal? And then the performing, just executing that plan. But that's all um, kind of boring educational theory. Um, I would love to hear how Lazar does that on a daily basis with the community development. This important as well, right? Um, you 
as I said, you have an easier job of forming a community initially if you have a great product and a great team. And I, you know, I can say from my own personal experience, you know, that the team which I'm able to work with right now is the best team I ever met in my life. Right? Are they? They've always strived to build the best possible products, regardless, you know, of uh, the sentiment of the market or whatever. They just wanted to build something sustainable and think long term and that's what approached me to the project itself but you know you know it's easy to um explain that when your community is small right when your community is small and it's core and it's gathered it's going to mostly probably form around the same ideology initially right but as you scale and grow there's a lot of noise around right so it's hard for people to always recognize the signal I'm not always the person that's going to let you know all about my project. You know, somebody might have heard something or or, or or read something and they've interpreted in their own, you know, way. And, you know, that creates some sort of like level of noise and, you know, level of storming, as, as you know, these slides say. Right. Um, things get hectic sometimes. And uh, at that point in time, it's very important from a community manager to, you know, do the best thing to. Uh, evaluate the situation in order to find, again, the best type of content and context and the best type of approach to create certain norms for all the ones that are already there and the ones that will join the community in the future so that the performance of the community management team and the team all across is at its highest level as the time goes by. Again, you know, uh, I feel that this part here is probably one of the hardest to assess when building a project because you don't know what to anticipate. There are a lot of things that are not dependable only on your the quality of your product and the quality of your community, but the marketplace in general and individuals that are keep on coming in and coming out of it. But I feel that you know if you have this kind of flow of observing situation, forming, storming, norming, and uh, performing, that that that's a good basis of you know keeping the flow of the community pretty healthy and you know as a, a prerequisite of healthy engagement and this next one is kind of we touched on it a little bit earlier this is my absolute favorite i love this guy um his name is elliot aronson and he's out of uc uh, santa cruz when uh we were doing some work with the chicago blockchain project and when we were looking um joe wanted to know some different things about uh kind of what synergy and, and like the deficit model because i talk a lot about the deficit model um i pulled this because this guy is not only amazing but he has a long-standing reputation for explaining exactly why a punitive society doesn't work and why an incentivized society works Right. And that goes right back to the product and creating, you know, and different tokens and things. So this gentleman, um, he's one of my favorite uh, philosophers, like I said, or theorists. And he started it was a desegregation of schools in Texas and all the links are there. Um, and the way that he saw it was like this, this suspicion, this fear, this anger, like there's always these like missed goals or this misunderstanding of goals when you misalign the of goals when you have. Um, these feelings right and so what he saw was that uh this this uh long-standing suspicion and fear was that's what the distrust was built upon right and that it was out of competition and so that what that did was that laid the groundwork for collaboration and the beauty of collaboration and synergy um and that's what i like to do is i like to try to um find what people are really passionate about and um, then pair them up with someone that either compliments them or if they have a need, they're like, oh, yeah, but I'm just not very good at that. Like find someone that is very similar, but has that. And then you just pair them up. That goes back to like Kennedy's eggheads. Um, President Kennedy uh, did this very similar thing. Right. He knew that he couldn't be the end all be all for everything. Um, and he totally acknowledged that. And so his cabinet was surrounded. That's what, why they called it Kennedy's eggheads. Um, was so he surrounded himself by the best and the brightest. And I think that Joe has spoken on this, um, where he said, if you go to a room, and I'm probably going to misquote him, but if you go to a room and, you know, you just find the smartest person there and you stand next to them and you absorb everything that they're saying, right? Because everyone has their own value. Everyone has their, their strengths. And so the deficit model then basically says, oh, no, you, you know, you suck at this, so I'm going to make you better at this, right? 
But that's not where education is going. Education has actually transcended that part of it, right? Now what we want to do is we want to build on strengths. That happens in the corporate world. You see it at WeWork. You see it at 1871. You see it everywhere. That they, everyone has the, these uh, these important value points, right? And so by pairing them up and helping them, you can create a far stronger project and a far stronger team, right? And that just goes right back to that jigsaw and the empowerment. And I definitely recommend um, Professor Aronson's work. Uh, he is absolutely amazing. And if you have, you know, if you have any needs in your community that, you know, oh, uh, you know, this person is like, Maybe they're, whether they're a detractor or whether they're not getting it, you just try to find someone that is, um, has maybe I match them and I call it digital matchmaking, right? We like to do that for Chicago blockchain projects. Um, I love to connect people. And that's why, because this is just, it's the ultimate best slide to me. Um, and this is uh, an amazing guy. But it's the one thing that actually explains why punitive uh, systems don't work. I mean, I do write about it ad nauseum, but punitive systems just don't work. They don't work in the classroom. Do you think that, I mean, what's your experience, Lazar? It's 100% the same as you said. It's like listening to you, I, I felt like this is probably the place where I won't be able to add anything because it, it's fully a complete story. As you said, I feel like that at this point in time, we definitely all focus on, you know, doubling down on our personal strengths and therefore you know try to develop the same mindset within our community members as well you know not not so much to concentrate i can maybe relate this to an example of many sort of in my personal opinion wasting their time bashing other projects talking about competition or or whatever kind or for whatever kind whereas i feel that you should you know take a look at your own projects and your own communities and try to find those you know the best use cases, the brightest people, and double down on, on all of that together to get the highest possible value out of your community in the end. I feel that, you know, building sustainable communities is done exactly that way by, you know, recognizing the core community members and, you know, try to build long last, uh, you know, long lasting and long term relationships with them. Because, you know, in the end, no matter the price, no matter the market cap, you all share common values and therefore they will always be there as a part of the community that you can rely on. That is so well said because I think that anytime you can empower someone, right? And you um, basically, it's just like everyone has value. So find yours. You know, and if you uh, are a, you know, fearful that you don't have value, let me tell you about 25 ways you do because, you know, and I think that those communities and through the memes i think it's so funny because i love memes some of them i do not get quite honestly that bit the next thing and the carlos thing i'm still trying to understand oh, yeah. that <laughs> <laughs> but um and that's because i came into this space a little later but anytime that you can say to someone all right well you know what you help me in this way so i think that that is so valuable and i love the fact that i think that there is so much overlap between education schools running a classroom and community right on um, the community in the blockchain space and that is one of the things that drew me in was just there's a low barrier to entry it's something that i talk to a lot of people about and like no these people because when you first see the word blockchain you're like oh my god these people are going to expect me to be like an mit graduate and be able to speak in code and all these crazy things that i cannot do but i'm like no it's the most welcoming um environment Ever, whether you're at a conference or anytime you are anywhere, um, people just love to talk. And it's not about, it's not about, oh, how great I am. It's about, oh, look at this cool project. And they're addressing this use case. And then you can be like, oh, whoa, you know, in Chi Town Crypto, I've I've learned about so many different things. I'm like, wow, that's really cool. Have you talked to this person? It's, it's just that to me is like the most important part. And that's where the education. Um, and the practicality come in, but, um, and that's my little daughter. And she, um, she actually in her classroom said that um, when she was asked the first day of school, what math was for or what numbers were for, she said, Bitcoin and business deals. So she's learning something from her mom, I guess. <laughs> but uh, yeah, and that, thank you very much to the Blockchain Institute for that cup, because that's her favorite cup and she must have it every time that she's with me. But Lazar, what is your experience? Well, again, it's, it's all the same as, as you said it yourself. I felt like that 
from the very beginning of my journey, uh, which you know started from a completely different career background. Um, I, I felt the support of first and foremost the local and then the global community in the process of first educating myself. And then later down the road, they gave me all the patterns that I needed in order to keep on educating others. And I feel that if you're embraced in such a way that in, in a, this world of capitalism where we uh, hear the word competition all the time, when you're embraced by uh, people in an industry where it's all about collaboration, it feels very nice to people. I feel that, you know, by nature, we're built to work together and build things together, right? So uh, I feel that, you know, blockchain and cryptocurrency space at its current state, especially in our local community, I have to say, uh, has, you know, given me an opportunity in a way to express myself fully. They gave me an opportunity, regardless of, you know, my background, regardless of where I come from uh, professionally or personally. And I think that that's the most important thing of this whole story, right? I feel that, you know, you as a teacher also have to approach all children, looking at them the same, embracing all of their, you know, flaws and all of their uh, bright sides and moments. And uh, I feel that the only community that I've seen replicating that up to a, a point where it's, you know, great is crypto community. Absolutely. Yeah. I could so. not have said that any any better. Honestly, that is exactly what I love about this, is that it takes people where it is, and uh, it takes people where they are, and then it, uh, you know, just, and it's just, it's, it's to me, it's absolutely amazing <laughs> what, um, what this community has done. We are, we are, um, we are built for, to be builders. And <laughs> we are built to be builders, and I couldn't have said it better myself. Sorry, it's confused about the slide there. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I just wanted to basically, as we said, like, it's very important to give people the right content initially, right? That's what, what, what you know, with what all begins. So whether you're a community manager that's going to listen to this at one point in time, and you, you know, you want to educate somebody, but you don't know from where to start or how to start or how to create content that's going to create engagement later down the road. Here are some good suggestions from which you can start. Some of them are local based like Bellas Commerce from HANA or Chicago Blockchain Project, some of the stuff that Joe has compiled together. And some of them are like the basic, you know, the elementary stuff that one needs to go through by, you know, when learning about Bitcoin and everything. But it's not just about learning about different cryptocurrencies. What I found very insightful about this type of content is exactly the verbiage, the, the context, which is probably as important as the content is, that will be the most appropriate for your own community. So whether you're a community manager or a part of a community that wants to contribute more, which I encourage you to do, uh, take a look at these resources and start providing higher levels of value within your communities. It will pay off multiple times by you know a tenfold at least uh, it did for me so I, I i wish to believe that it will happen the same for everybody else as well and i um anytime you have any questions or anything i don't know um the depth of knowledge that lazar does he is absolutely one of my favorite resources to go to when i have a question and he's always very responsive on telegram um but if, uh, you know, I'm sure Lazar would echo this, if you have any questions or comments or want to know more, um, you can always, always reach out to us, you know, there's LinkedIn or email, um, we'll put all of our information up there. And um, perfect. Yeah. Yeah. And connect with me on LinkedIn. And if you are looking for content like Lazar, I can't, I can't even tell you. Like I and a bunch of other stuff like that, because as I said, you know, it was pretty obvious that it's not an inherent thing to know about. And I, I know that I haven't, that I didn't know it. So, um, you know, I, I encourage all the people just to go back 10 steps, you know, before they start thinking about how to approach their community. And remember that once upon a time, they were all newbies and somebody need to teach them. And if you were self-taught, I think that's even better. But, you know, 
you should try not to let everybody just self-teach themselves. Pe people can get confused and we know all about BitConnects of the world <laughs> and everything. So, you know, create meaningful content and create meaningful interaction if you have an opportunity. Definitely, I, I encourage you all to do so. So Lazar and Jenny, thank you so much. Um, that brings me, what you're just described actually brings me to a question, which is, are there certain, um, you, you know, we all know there are many different channels and ways to communicate with the cryptocurrency community. Are there specific ways where you educate on Telegram versus Reddit, or is there a channel that you prefer one over the other? Tell me a little bit more about how you actually do the educating. Well, I mean, the every channel sort of gives you its benefit, you know, it's up, it has its upsides and downsides, right? You know, uh, I wouldn't like if we're talking uh, about concrete solutions, I wouldn't say that, you know, Reddit is the place where you can teach people one on one. It's a great place to distribute content at a larger scale so that you can capture a larger demographics in crypto. And that can be that first signal that you give to somebody that you have insightful comments, right? Then, you know, if, if, you, if you're lucky enough and if those people were lucky enough to read something and find something meaningful out of that content, I would assume that the best place and the best way to educate somebody is through on a one-on-one -on -one basis in a way or in a, in a basis similar to a classroom, right, where you can act as a teacher for a smaller group of people so that, you know, again, we can uh, distinct signal from the noise and places like Slack, Discord or Telegram come in handy. So basically chats where people can engage in between each other. And, you know, uh, the choice of, of, of the medium that's going to be used, I would say it, it only depends on, you know, the, the preference of the team. If you provide quality and if you are able to digest your message in a proper manner, I would assume that any chat is good for education and any any medium is good for education. As long as you know, you know, what are you offering and what, how to offer the, va the value that you do and, you know, why are you building solutions that you do uh, in the first place? So, yeah, I hope I helped out with, with, with that answer. Yeah, yeah I would that's really just add on to that. Like, I do, and I think a lot of people in the crypto group, at least, just uh, share articles back and forth. And sometimes that is just so helpful. I'm not, you know, you're not even telling anyone which way to go on that. You're not, you know, but you're like, hey, here's an interesting article, which, um, and, the, and that's why I like uh, I like Twitter for that. I do uh, the Chicago Blockchain Project uh, Twitter mostly, and um, I think that just offering those resources and kind of letting people uh, peruse them at their own at their own interest level. It, once you once you spark their value, or once you spark you like you hook their value, I suppose, and then all of a sudden they're like, Blizzard said, "Whoa, you do have insightful comments." Then they start going back and reading, which is pretty cool. Um, so I think it's just it can be almost any platform. It just I think more so it's dependent upon um, maybe like your the method of delivery, right? Like if it's a drip method or if you're really trying to do a scope and sequence and lay out this first, this first. I don't know. Does that answer that question, Judy? Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to try to give the people out there some ideas about where where they could be um, focusing educational content. Um, I think those are all the questions I have. Is there anything else, uh, Jenny and Lazar, that you want to add? Well, Biddle, uh, uh, Biddle always wins the huddle. And, uh, <laughs> you know, try to, you know, build things, move fast and break things, as Facebook used to say, or as we say in crypto, release early and often. And, you know, uh, just give value over, give true value over anything, right? Go beyond your token try to, you know, build the foundation of your communities on education. Absolutely. And I'm just going to say, like, what I always say, that everything comes down to education. Whether it's, you know, it doesn't matter what field it is, it's always about education. And whether it's sales, you're educating to the point of a sale. If it's crypto, you're educating to the point of buying a token, perhaps. Um, everything comes down to education. And I think that's just a fundamental society. But I'm kind of biased on that. I'll just admit that. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you both so much. Um, so on the screen are all our emails and um, the Omnisparks Telegram. If anyone has any questions after 
the presentation. We'll be posting the presentation and a, a copy of the presentation on um, our social channels and on the Chicago blockchain social channels for anyone who has any questions. So next week, uh, we'll be having the fourth webinar. Um, we are thrilled to have David Spinks from CMX, which is the premier community for community professionals. He is going to be presenting their framework for building community. Thank you so much for attending. And for those of you in the United States, happy Thanksgiving. Thank you, Judy.